sea level rise is one of the most serious consequences of the human-induced climate crisis. The water rise is from heat expansion of the oceans, melting polar caps, vanishing glaciers, and the loss of fresh water. Satellites are an essential tool to monitor the changes and help climate modelers prepare us for the future. NOAA GHOST-T satellite in geosynchronous orbit is a recent addition of the next generation of satellites. It is the Western Hemisphere's most sophisticated weather observing and environmental monitoring system covering over half the globe. Along with the decades-long Sentinel series of satellites, Sentinel-6, a collaboration of European and US space agencies and climate monitoring institutes, is continuing the mission of uninterrupted, sophisticated data gathering for climate scientists and modelers. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise, but also the waves, uh, the significant wave height, which is the top one third of, of, of the waves, if you were to, to, to look at them in time. So the biggest waves that you would see. Uh, this is important for marine operations, and the altimeters provide perhaps some of them uh, the best uh, data sets that we have today uh, over the, the global ocean. We have plenty of buoys in the ocean uh, that measure uh, waves, but they're often in the coastal zone. And it's only when you go to uh, the altimetry uh, that you can really have this, this global coverage. We all know sea level is rising. And how do we know that? Uh, because we measured this uh, since the 90s from space through a series of satellites. It started with uh, Topex Poseidon, which was a French-American satellite, followed by the JSON 1, 2 and 3 series, which was also a French-American satellite. And um, Sentinel-6, as you said, also called JSON-CS, stands for Continuity of Service, is uh, meant to go in orbit to follow JSON-3 to continue the, the record of the sea level since about 30 years. And we want to continue that record for another five years and demonstrate and quantify the sea level rise we have been observing since the 90s. In average, about 3.2 millimeters per year, even though the scientists tell us in the last year this has been accelerating, in particular due to the acceleration in melting of ice. So over the last years, it's above 4 millimeters every year we record in the sea level. We talk about uh, the impact of, of melting snow and ice surfaces in terms of what's known as the albedo effect. Um, when snow is dry, it's very reflective, and of course that helps to uh, reflect sunlight uh, back out into space, and the consequence is we can reduce uh, the amount of melting this way. However, as um, ice and snow melt, uh, the albedo and the reflectivity becomes lower, and this has the effect of absorbing more uh, of the solar energy. This contributes to further warming and further melting. And so it's a runaway uh, progressive effect uh, caused by the reduction in the albedo. Satellites are a, a major source of uh, global, timely 
uh, long-term data sets, uh, which is in particular very important for climate, because uh, we need to have long-term data series to actually understand how the climate is changing over decades, for example, and to also understand what the trend of these changes are going to be. There is a way to make an entrance. My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veeley today. Um, so we are using a, um, a large variety of different uh, data sets. Um, we're mainly concentrating on the European Space Agency's data sets. Uh, and there's a, a mixture between uh, data sets that come from you know, a, a heritage mission, like for instance, Envisat and ERS, because we're looking also back, of course, in, in terms of climate. But we're also using data that are coming in right now, for example, from the Sentinels missions that are running under the uh, Copernicus program that we are running together or collaborating with the uh, European Union and, and UMISA together. Um, but we're also using actually quite uh, new technology and um, you know, satellites that address um, scientific questions that haven't been addressed before. So it's a mixture of different uh, data sources that we are trying to combine in these uh, climate data records. What we do is we also work with partner agencies worldwide. So we exchange data over climate. We do work on calibration activities. We support activities linked to, for example, ice loss volume monitoring. And we have done that with the US partners over India campaign over the Arctic region. To calibrate the satellites in orbit, scientists on the ground take measurements in situ all around the globe, from the Antarctic to the Arctic and glaciers around the world. They then compare results and validate the satellite data. And we're producing climate data records, so long-term data records of uh, climate-relevant um, indicators, let's say. Um, one of them you see behind me. Um, we are um, also producing uh, climate data records for glaciers, um, in particular the extent of the glacier, the, the velocity, um, but also the um, elevation. The ice loss in the Alps is um, comparably strong. So um, we have similar um, strong mass loss, I think, in the um, uh, Andes of uh, Peru and Bolivia, um, but also in uh, Patagonia, they have similar rates. Um, but uh, the most um, difficult thing or problematic thing is that th this ice loss in the Alps is um, still increasing. So now I, I think for something like 30, 35 years, we see higher and higher loss. And this takes place despite the fact um, that the region where ice can melt, the so-called ablation region, is shrinking. And uh, this is a very strong signal for um, accelerated climate change and an increased forcing, which means uh, that temperatures have to increase and, and increase and push the snow line higher and higher so that more um, areas are exposed um, to melt. Those projections uh, tell us what glaciers will look like. What they will look like very much depends on, on what we human beings will we do next in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we manage to, um, to mitigate climate change very much, we'll have glaciers that will still shrink, but will shrink a lot less than if we don't manage to get hold of this climate crisis that is literally unfolding. So in the worst case, where really our emissions will continue to go unabated until the end of the century, well, this place where we're standing is going to be ice-free for sure. But even the highest elevation that we see here, they are most likely be ice-free as well. On the contrary, if we now really manage to put effort in abating emissions, we will be able to save, say, at least 40% of the ice. So half of this place is gone anyway, uh, but still there will be something that we can look at and that we can show to our children and that our children can show to our grandchildren.
I think uh, the recent record since uh, Cryosat, one of our satellites, has been flying has shown that there's quite some fluctuation in, in the amount of ice uh, transferred from land to the ocean. Um, however, we have seen that sea level rise has been accelerating over the last several years. One of the um, uh, reasons is thought to be related to the increased melting of uh, land glaciers. And a recent publication has shown that in fact uh, the contribution of glaciers to sea level uh, rise is increasing. And we've gone from a situation in the 1970s and 80s where it was contributing only a fraction of a millimeter a year to something closer uh, to one millimeter a year. This is around 20, 25 percent of uh, the sea level rise signal globally. And so glaciers are obviously having uh, an increasing contribution to sea level rise over the last two decades. The European Space Agency is doing a lot in providing the evidence for a changing climate. If you think about the Earth Observation Programme, for example, I think the majority of activities are really directly addressing this, this question. And it starts um, at the you know, perceiving uh, new satellite measurements. So, um, you know, one of the core activities of uh, the European Space Agency in the Earth Observation Programme is, of course, to build satellites. And there's different flavors of these satellites that address, you know, new technologies, new scientific questions, like, for instance, the Earth Explorers. But then there is the, um, the Sentinel missions that we are developing uh, in collaboration with the European Union and with UMITSAT, who provide, for example, continuity on many of these uh, measurements, but also improve over um, um, coming decades because we have a lot of experience in, in, in these measurements. And I think so, we're doing in ESA, I think something. It's, it's almost like covering the entire food chain of, of providing climate relevant um, information. And I think this is, this is quite an amazing fact because we, you know, we, we really follow through from the beginning of the measurement up to the point where we're actually talking to the people who put the policies in place. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a really good uh, foundation that we're providing from uh, the ESA's perspective. So when you fly around the Earth at 400 kilometers, you have a very unique point of view that is at the same time a privilege and a curse. It is a privilege because, of course, not many people get to do it. Not many people get to fly in space and look down at the Earth. It is a curse because what you see is um, at the same time so beautiful and so fragile that certainly breaks your heart and it it is what inspired me to start talking about wh what happened what is, what is happening on planet earth and about everything that we take for granted today and as a matter of fact that same feeling of helpless helplessness and desire to do something um, i felt in this last couple of days talking to the scientists, talking to the explorers, and being myself part of the group on this glacier and looking with my eyes, touching with my hands, the same things that I felt from space. So if I, if I had to summarize uh, the feelings, which is always hard because feelings don't come in a linear way. They're always, they're always very mixed up. I feel a little bit of urgency and because it's me I also feel hope that people will listen and understand the urgency of what is happening and how fast we have to react before everything that we have will disappear. Low-lying uh, regions of the world, of course, are going to suffer the most from this kind of uh, impact in terms of ice melt and sea level rise. Of course, countries like Bangladesh already suffering from uh, the increased probability of storm surges um, as sea level rises. And coastal inundation is a problem for millions of people in Bangladesh. Uh, we also see it in more developed countries. We have a situation in Venice uh, during seasons of the year where tidal range and storm surges combine with sea level rise to cause what's known as aqua alta and there um, the whole of the, the the city of venice is inundated by water on a, on a regular basis during these periods of time 
So I think the societal impact of, of coastal inundation and, and flooding can affect millions of people in the future. And so uh, we need to monitor uh, the effects of melting ice and sea level rise. We got the long-term data and we got the long-term trend and we now finally realize that you have the long-term trend but you also have superimposed local variations. So some years it stops and other years it goes very quick. So it's a really very dynamic system and that just acts just really means that we have to have a continuous monitoring from space. I believe that there is uh, an awareness that is growing, but it's not enough yet. So uh, water being probably one of, the, one of the resources that we really need to check. And we are here because of that. Water as a cycle that we have interfered with. Um, ice become, turns into water, turns into uh, atmospheric water, and it accelerates uh, hurricanes, it accelerates flooding, it, it's all connected, and we have interfered with that cycle. So now we have to do something to take a step back. Well, one of the things that we can do is preservation without pollution. So little steps that everybody can do. Have a bottle of water and reuse it instead of continuing buying extra bo new bottles of water and polluting the earth with the plastic and uh, using extra water that we don't need. We can, we can live on very little water. Uh, we are just not used to do it because we don't, think it, and we don't think about it and we take it for granted. I believe that the perspective that I have comes from the awareness that on the space session, we live on very limited resources. We have to recycle them and we have to respect that awareness. What we're doing in the climate office, and not just in the climate office, but in, in the European Space Agency um, Earth Observation Program at large is, I think, you know, 90, 99% um, supporting uh, the course of understanding A, what our climate is doing, how our climate is changing, and that in turn can actually inform policymakers to take action of what needs to be done to either mitigate that effect, so basically, for example, limit emissions, so, um, or to adapt to things that we cannot change anymore. It's a very important um, physical evidence to give um, decision makers and policymakers a base to come up with um, plans of how we address this issue. Ice is changing a lot and ice is melting a lot. Whether it's a problem, of course, long term it's a problem because the sea level rise will go up. But it's also to some degree an opportunity for some of the Arctic countries that they can develop their countries. So it's climate change, monitor what is happening, make sure we, we can give a qualified statement. And especially the space is very important to give a qualified statement of what is really happening and not just some model prediction or some fancy outlook which could be way off. So I think we're the guys who give the hardcore facts. And as you say, I've been here for many years. I've seen the change on my own eyes because before we even got involved with European Space Agency, we did a lot of airborne, a lot of mapping work. We mapped with the first satellites already in the very late 1970s as the very first users of satellite navigation, namely for mapping remote and distant areas. So it's been really amazing to see and also amazing to see the changes and the changes are big, yeah. no doubt about that. And uh, we're producing these data sets also for the benefit of um, addressing these international climate drivers so that we actually know where we're standing at the moment in terms of the state of the climate and what actions need to be taken in the future in terms of policy uh, and decision making and adaptation and mitigation actions, for example, in the future. Be because of the availability of information that we are constantly bombarded with, there is a general feeling that we can all be experts and at everything and come up with our own opinion. I don't want to dismiss anybody's opinion, but I do want to listen to what experts and people who have devoted their lives to a certain study have to say. Now, it's a cycle. We have scientists who use their instruments to gather data, study those data, and come out with a theory. And 
once they come up with a theory and everybody agrees to it, then we should probably listen to that. But how do they get these instruments? How do they gather that data? Well, there is a whole community of people, te technicians, engineers, astronauts, operators, that work constantly, incessantly, to create the instruments and to position them and to create the basis so that the data can be collected in the correct way. The sea level will go up, no doubt about that. So people in Holland and the very low-lying areas, they should have good reasons to be concerned. So do we in Denmark. But again, right now it's only 10 centimeters, so we are talking uh, 2,100. We talk anywhere between 30, 40 centimeters and a meter. Then it's a little bit more concerning. And again, that's where this long-term space mission, they would tell these people who make the modeling and the prediction in the future, if they made the modeling earlier, will it really fit what we see today? If you take all the data today, will it fit in 10 years? That's why you have the, the big value of these continuous data. And also the continuous measurements really of do the satellites measure the right thing? Is the radar really measuring the surface or is it measuring somewhere else on the ice? That's, that's all the thick questions we are, we are concerned with. Most scientists agree we are past the point of no return. Now the focus is on trying to mitigate the most serious effects on the planet. So it is a concern, of course, and eventually we should do something about it. And again, the space mission can, you, can tell you in the long run, if you change something in the CO2 with the political side, will, they really, will it really matter? And for instance, the CO2, also in the Copernicus program and the ESA missions, you have CO2 missions which are really useful to actually pinpoint who are, who are the bad guys in this game, who is not cutting back eventually. As a scientist, um, I think we can provide data and the satellite data help us to do so. The the issue with the glaciers and the shrinking glaciers is a global scale phenomenon where people are really concerned that in the future um, there, there is no more ice or much less ice. And what we can provide as uh, scientists is solid data about how much ice there is, how the ice masses change and uh, maybe when you do some computer modeling also how much ice there will be in the future. And um, over the past 20, 30 years, I think the reporting uh, from us was more and more, yes, they are shrinking and glaciers are shrinking globally and they do it stronger and stronger. And we can repeat this information again and again and have it in IPCC reports and say, hey, there's a problem. Um, but of course, in the end, it depends if this message is picked up and um, converted to action. And here is then very soon the place where um, the engagement of scientists end, because this is a political thing. And um, what we can do is provide the best data and the best uh, uncertainty information we can get and say really we are sure about this and about this and about this and not so sure about this and then politicians have to decide on if they want to do something about it and we hope that at some point this will happen. It is the closest planet to Earth in size and distance. It once may have had oceans and a similar climate. Now it is hostile and unforgiving. Scientists want to know why and how it changed. This could help with the hunt for other habitable worlds. For now, Venus could be considered Earth's evil twin.
One of the brightest objects in the sky, Venus has been a world of mystery and conjecture. Probes were sent to briefly study the cloud tops as they pass by. The NASA Mariner mission, quickly followed by the Soviet Union series of Venera flights. They left more questions than answers in their wakes. Eventually, Venera 4 landed a probe through the dense atmosphere onto a searing hot surface, followed up with more sophisticated probes that lived for a very short time. Other probes floated briefly in the dense, poisonous atmosphere. Mars became a much more attractive target, and Venus has been left little explored. In the late 80s, the Magellan probe was launched from the space shuttle. It mapped the planet's surface with radar, giving us a detailed look at the rugged surface of the planet. Stripping away the dense, thick atmosphere revealed intricate mountains, volcanoes, and lava fields, an uninviting and hazardous environment hot enough to melt lead. Following orbiters from both Europe and Japan also studied the surface features with radar. The Venus Express dipped into the upper atmosphere to aerobreak and descended into lower orbits. In recent years, several probes have used Venus for gravity assists to propel them to other destinations. Bepi Colombo, on its way to study Mercury, passed by taking images and other readings. The maneuver, the second of Venus and the third of nine flybys overall, helped steer the spacecraft on course for Mercury. Another European spacecraft, the Solar Orbiter, also utilized Venus for a slingshot as it closed in on its solar orbit. The Parker Solar Probe made a close flyby taking measurements of the electric field of the planet and the radio emissions from the hot surface. It's thrilling to be able to see something that's never been seen before. This emission that we're seeing is, is thermal emission. Even on the night side, the surface of Venus is so hot that it's, it's glowing uh, uh, faintly at very red wavelengths. These whisper images, I think, are really exciting because they provide a new window into the lower atmosphere and surface region of Venus where these extreme conditions exist. A faint glow of heat from the night side shows distinctive features like continental regions, plains and plateaus. A luminescent halo of oxygen in the atmosphere can also be seen surrounding the planet. These observations revealed much about the chemical composition of the surface. Another really interesting thing we could look for is potentially mineralogical differences. Different rocks and different minerals emit different levels of heat. Some surprising results suggested that water may have been on Venus in the past, but climatic changes and planetary processes removed the water from the planet and its atmosphere. We have chemical fingerprints in Venus's atmosphere and on its surface, suggesting that Venus might have been habitable in the past. 
the wide-field imager, or whisper, is the sole imager aboard the Parker Solar Probe. This is something that's truly new, and I believe will yield exciting science in the long term. Once upon a time, Venus might just have been like an early Earth, with oceans, lakes, and rivers of liquid water, a much milder, oxygen-rich atmosphere. What changed the environment? Perhaps volcanic eruptions and toxic gases creating an atmosphere of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid clouds trapping heat in a greenhouse effect. Venus has the hottest surface of any planet in our solar system, hotter than Mercury. The atmospheric pressure is nearly 75 times greater than that of Earth. NASA and ESA are returning to the planet to find some answers. Europe is sending the spacecraft in vision in partnership with NASA, which is providing the synthetic aperture radar system called VENSAR. The S-band radar will also act as a microwave radiometer and altimeter to map the surface. Envision will also carry three optical spectrometers designed to observe the surface and atmosphere of Venus, and a subsurface radar sounder that will probe the top kilometer of subsurface. NASA will also be sending Da Vinci and Veritas to Venus, due to be launched around 2029. Veritas stands for Venus Emissivity, Radio Science, INSAR, Topography and Spectroscopy Mission. It will also map Venus's surface to determine the planet's geologic history. Germany and France are contributing to the infrared mapper and radar systems to determine whether active volcanoes are releasing water vapor into the atmosphere. Da Vinci, the atmospheric probe, will descend into the Venusian atmosphere to study the gases and chemistry with advanced sensors. It is designed to survive the descent to ground level whilst imaging its journey. The one meter wide probe will target a region called Alpha Regio, twice the size of Texas and will add to scientists' understanding of rocky, atmosphere-bearing exoplanets that will be explored by new observatories such as the James Webb Space Telescope. So Venus is cool. Venus is awesome. Venus is, the, in many ways, one of the most Earth-like planets that we know of. Um, one of the key ways that it's different is that it's very, very dry. With Temperatures on the surface of 460 degrees centigrade, and whatever that is in Fahrenheit, you would never expect there to be liquid oceans on the surface. That kind of temperature only boils off that water into steam, but the atmosphere of Venus is still incredibly dry, so where did the steam go? So to talk about how we remove something from a planet, we're gonna have to talk about two forces of nature. Firstly, the force of gravity. Gravity is the thing which is holding you down to the planet, but if you think about it, it's also what is holding the atmosphere down onto the planet as well. If I want to remove some of the oxygen from the planet, we have to overcome that gravity. So to do that, I want to talk about the electric force. It's the thing which your device is using right now to pump electricity around its wires, right? It's pushing the electrons around the circuits. And what we think can happen is that the electric force can help 
push on the ions and the, you know, the, in the upper parts of the atmosphere, push them off and up into space. So just as every planet has a gravity field, we think that every planet has a weak electric field. So we went looking for Venus's electric field, and boy oh boy did we find it. It turns out that Venus's electric field is at least five to ten times stronger than at Earth. It's a monster of a force. It can rip heavy things like oxygen straight out of the upper atmosphere and send them kicking and screaming off into space. So this really changes the way we have to think about planets, because it turns out that planets can lose heavy things like oxygen to space entirely through electrical forces in their ionospheres. This is something that's really important if we want to go looking for exoplanets, for habitable planets around other stars. It is no good having conditions perfect for an ocean and an atmosphere that you might want to breathe if some invisible force is going to come along and rip it all off into space. Only understanding how atmospheres evolve can we try and understand how we got here. Many orbiting telescopes and instruments are now in use to search for, identify, and catalog exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. TESS, Kepler, Hubble, James Webb, and the Nancy Roman telescopes are looking at planetary formations around various stars. Knowing how Venus evolved would give additional assistance to the planet searchers. This image is of a new star and its gas disk. The black rings show where planets are forming by gathering the dust and debris. This image reveals a moon forming around a gas giant as it evolves. This massive exoplanet orbits a white dwarf, the remnant of a dead star, and is slowly evaporating. Another big unknown is to characterize planets that are orbiting other stars. So we could now, astronomers have got very good at finding these planets, but what we want to do is look at what they're made of. So what's in their atmospheres, or if, if they were rocky, what kinds of minerals are we seeing? And to be able to do that, I think will be stupendous. So this, we can see the, uh, the composition of the atmosphere and exoplanet, so what it's made of. And the specific planet we're looking at is hot. Um, and so what we see in that is that there's water there. And it wouldn't be in liquid form because the planet's hot, so it would be more like steam that's around it. But we can tell what's in that atmosphere. 
So the James Webb Space Telescope is brilliant in a number of ways. One, it extends our wavelength all the way into the infrared, into the mid-infrared, so we can look for these heat signatures from these planets as well. But that also means we can cover the fingerprints of different materials in the atmosphere. So the Hubble Space Telescope looks for fingerprints of sodium and potassium and water in the atmospheres of these worlds. But the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to look for signatures of methane and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, as well as all of these wonderful water features that we'll be seeing in these giant planet atmospheres. But not only can it tell us in these different wavelength ranges, it's actually better resolution so we can get more data points for each of these different molecules. And it's a much bigger telescope. We're collecting far more light. We can get a much better precision. So that means that the um, degree to which we believe our measurements is going to improve a lot with this telescope. And that can, that's going to mean that we'll be able to tell you with confidence what we're measuring. Looking for life on other planets is the ultimate future goal of all of these missions, trying to understand how we got here, how the Earth is the way it is. The James Webb Space Telescope is taking us one step further towards that goal. We're going to be pushing to the smaller world where we can see uh, what different planets that are unlike ones in our solar system are like, how atmospheres change with the size of your planet. And it's also going to give us information on these giant planets that we don't have in our solar system, so close to their star that they're hotter than a rocket. They're different worlds that we can explore with this, and every technique that we use with the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be the technique we need to be looking for life signatures on these other worlds. So getting good at using this technique is so important so that in the future we can be looking for these signatures. So what we see here is uh, what's called a hot Jupiter. So it's a, it's a planet that moves in front of its star, and it has about the size of Jupiter, but the mass of, uh, of Saturn. And what we see here is light filters through its atmosphere, and that allows us to look for the fingerprints of certain molecules. And in this case, the planet is full of water vapor, full of water. Um, and that's what you see as wiggles in the spectrum. When we go and look at other exoplanets with Webb, we may look for other molecules, some that are familiar in our own atmosphere here as well, like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, or maybe even methane and ozone. The total so far exceeds 5,000 exoplanets, with a further 8,000 to be confirmed of particular interest are the smaller, rocky, Earth-like planets. We know our targets. They're bright stars which are known to host the type of planets we want to observe. And we will know when these planets transit. That is when the planets move across the disk of the star and we can measure the changes in the output of the star, the measured output of the star, in order to measure the size of the planet. We'll be focusing on smaller planets, so Earth-sized to Neptune-sized planets, which have been found by other missions, such as Kepler, to be very abundant around other sun-like stars, something which is not so much the case in our own solar system. So it's a big question. What are these smaller planets? What are they made of? The range of planet types is amazing. Rocky worlds that sustain oceans and lakes, likely candidates for life. Others more extreme, like WASP-76P, tidally locked to its star, only ever showing one face to its sun. This extreme exoplanet has a day side where metals evaporate and a night side where it rains iron.
rogue planets that have no sun to orbit, ejected from their solar system and left to roam through space. Planets that have the heavy element barium in their atmosphere. Water worlds, planets still forming, others around dying stars. We must remember that amidst all these searches for a new Earth, we must take care of the one we have, because it is a very long way to travel to reach these other habitable worlds.